It's Thursday the 19th of March today. This is vlog number three of my experience of the COVID pandemic as a junior doctor in the UK. Because it's number three, I'm gonna do three things today. So the first thing is I'm gonna to talk to you about how we normally assess patients in A&E or what many would call the emergency room in other parts of the world. So then I'm gonna contrast that with how COVID-19 patients are gonna present and what kind of management. So that'll be in the second half of this video. And the third thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try and not get any complaints about my terrible hair. That one's probably gonna be the hardest objective to achieve. So off we go to work. Don't forget to wash down commonly tucked surfaces, guys, and wash your hands as well. Hashtag fomites. nice little parking space again today. We're on a winner. So to talk about what I normally do, let's take the example of a patient arriving by ambulance with a breathing problem. And then we'll talk about the process. So this is a general framework that will work for any doctor in any specialty. This is how they'll be approaching a patient. Now there's two kind of pathways in your mind that you need to assess a patient. The first one is if someone is acutely unwell. That's really where we can't wait to think of a diagnosis. We need to get to work straight away. And for that, we use a framework called the A to E assessment. Now, I'm not gonna talk about that framework in this video. I'm gonna talk about the second framework because that gives us more of a narrative history and that gives me more of an idea to express what we're talking about. That really has three parts to it. The history and examination, the investigations, and the management, which is great because I have three parts of the day today. I've got before my shift, during my shift and after my shift. So let's tackle one at a time. Okay, so let's assume our patients come in by ambulance and they're stable. They'll then come into one of our rooms in A&E and we'll do another set of OBS before doing our approach of taking a full history. So we'll take the example of a respiratory illness because that's what COVID-19 is. So the key symptoms we wanna talk about in a respiratory history are shortness of breath because that gas exchange isn't happening in the lungs. Cough, because if there's any irritation to the airway, such as infection in the airways, then that can cause a cough. And with that cough, we wanna see if, they're, if it's productive or not, if they're bringing anything up. So any sputum, and we particularly, with a bit of strange creatures, we wanna know what color the sputum is because that can indicate a bacterial or a viral infection infection and we also ask if there's any blood as well. We also want to ask about any chest pain. So chest pain associated with the lung tends to be what we call pleuritic and it tends to be a sharp pain worse on inspiration. And we want to ask about wheeze. Now wheeze is generally associated with obstructive lung diseases such as asthma. Don't forget as well the lungs are connected to the whole body so we want to ask if there's any constitutional symptoms. So symptoms that the whole body struggling with what's ever happening in the lung things like fever so your inflammatory response your reaction to the infection raises your body temperature up any fatigue or muscle ache again all those kind of immune chemicals in the body make you feel really unwell and give you muscle ache and the last thing we should really ask about is any weight loss but that tends to be more associated with kind of long-term illnesses now don't forget these symptoms can also indicate other things going wrong in the body for example short of breath and chest pain really want to inquire about the heart as well but so this is more of a framework to learn medicine rather than practically do it then we move on to talking about the patient's past medical history so any conditions they have and then we ask about patient's drug history and within that we should check the patient's allergies then we ask about any family history of illnesses and then we move on to any social history and so smoking is particularly important finally we want to ask about what the patient thinks might be going on so any ideas they have any concerns you know what's worrying them and what are their expectations? What do they like to get out of the consultation? So that's the kind of typical flow that we do. So when the patient first comes in, I'll take a full history. And the reason why that's super important because it guides everything else we're gonna do. So at that point, I'd do an examination, look at their basic observations. So their respiratory rate, how quick they're breathing, their oxygen saturation, so how much oxygen is bound to their red blood cells their heart rate and blood pressure, and also their temperature too, because the temperature, as we said earlier, could indicate an inflammatory process, such as an infection. We then do a respiratory examination, so observing the patient at the end of the bed, 
looking at their hands, their face, feeling any lymph nodes, and then examining the chest, including auscultating. So listening to see if there's air coming in and out of the chest, if there's any wheeze, or if there's any added sound, such as kind of hearing fluid from an infection. So once I've done this, I might come up with a working diagnosis, or what I think might be going on with the patient, and then order some investigations. So the investigations can take a couple of hours to come back, so in between that, I might see another patient, but right now, I'm gonna start my shift and I'll talk about investigations halfway through. Okay, the time is half past eight and I am halfway through the shift and it's been a really good shift while I'm over halfway through the shift. It's just gone so quickly today. It's been a really nice team to have on. I feel like I see the same things in most of the vlogs, but I'm not seeing anyone with COVID-19 myself at the moment. Um, we have those the pod system as well, so they get isolated straight away. It's not like literally a pod, it's just a room that's um, people are aware that that's why they're in there and um, people with the correct protective equipment will um, see those patients. So all those patients are in the same part of A&E, which makes sense. Make sure that that risk isn't spread to other people and a particular staff are designated, which is, I think, a really good idea. Although they're calling that side the dirty side, which <laughs> is not great, like who's working on the dirty side? Um, I have seen some patients with respiratory conditions, so I've been doing what I told earlier, so doing the full histories and examinations. And then the next part, what we talked about, is arranging investigations. So in general, any kind of investigations we think about, bedside tests, bloods, imaging, and special tests. So a bedside respiratory test would be things like a peak flow, which is really useful in illnesses such as asthma. And we'd also probably wanna do an ABG, so an arterial blood gas. That is technically a blood test, but it's we get the results straight away. So it's something we can kind of do at the bedside, and that gives us loads of useful information about the kind of oxygen levels and carbon dioxide levels in the blood, as well as the pH of the blood and some of the electrolytes too. But the more formal blood test we want, we'd really be looking at things like the hemoglobin. So this is the patient's anemic. We'd look at the white cells. So they're the immune cells that go up when we have an infection. So if someone's come in with something like a, a bacterial pneumonia, We'd often expect the white cells to go up. And within that, we can then look to see which particular white blood cells have gone up. For example, neutrophils tend to go up in a bacterial infection. Another really useful inflammatory marker along with a white cell count is the CRP. In terms of imaging to look at the lungs, we go for a chest X-ray. They're pretty crude, but they can tell us some great information about what's going on. Sometimes if we need to investigate further, we will then go on to do a CT scan. But they're the kind of investigations we do for anyone that's coming with those respiratory symptoms. So now I'm gonna finish off my shift and I'll come back later talk to you about anything that's happened on the shift, and then we'll talk about our basic framework, how we manage these respiratory conditions. There you have it, another shift. It is 20 past midnight, and another good day. We're working well within our limits at the moment, so it's giving us a chance to prepare things. There are some small changes happening, but nothing really that we're seeing on the ground or nothing really to report. Yeah, we've had some potential COVID-19 cases. We had some people present today with mild symptoms that didn't need to be in hospital and were just demanding to get a swab, which is not the current advice. By them coming into hospital, they're potentially exposing all the other people, you know, other people with health conditions, other vulnerable people to the virus. So if your condition is mild, stay at home and follow advice, the self-isolation advice that is currently being put out by the government. And so to wrap up our journey of a respiratory patient, the last thing we want to do is come up with a diagnosis based on our investigations and then a management plan. So let's just come up with a diagnosis of a bacterial pneumonia. So for that, we would have our treatment plan. A good framework is conservative, medical, and surgical. The conservative things are more kind of lifestyle and long-term changes, which obviously have a massive impact, but in an acute setting, in a hospital setting, we're less concerned about those type of things, but we'd like to give good advice when patients get discharged, for example, in respiratory, to give them advice on stopping smoking. But really, we're talking about the medical approach. So what kind of medical approaches if someone's got bacterial pneumonia, would be things like oxygen to help support their breathing if they need it, antibiotics to actually deal with the underlying infection, and would also want to give them fluids if they need it, because when we have an infection, we can often need more fluids. There'd be no real need for a surgical intervention in that patient. So once we've got a management plan, we need to decide two things. Is this plan better done in a hospital setting 
or can the patient be discharged home with a follow-up plan? So now you know the approach we take for a patient with a respiratory condition. We do the history, examination, investigations, and management. So now we're gonna look at how that would look like in a COVID-19 patient. But before that, I'm gonna get some sleep and we've got an excellent respiratory consultant that's gonna talk us through it tomorrow. When I did my interview with Sonia, everyone basically said, you're sitting too close. Uh, okay, fair enough. You're yeah. supposed to be social yeah, 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 yeah. distancing. Okay, fair so, Dr. Steve Jenkins, Spiritual Consultant Hi, nice here. to see you. How are you doing? I'm good, yeah, busy. I can imagine. Mm. Earlier on in the mm. channel, I talked about how we see patients come into a &E with respiratory problems, mm -hmm. how we look at their history, the investigations, and then the management. Mm -hmm. So, I would want to then ask your opinion on how people come in with COVID-19. What type of things are we seeing? Okay. So I think, and that's something that we're all learning about at the moment, because actually this is a new disease. So for us as doctors, this is a learning experience. And um, obviously some of the public are learning a lot about it as well. And what I would say is that essentially this is a viral pneumonia. So the, the coronavirus causes a viral pneumonia. It's like a, uh, any other form of pneumonia. It's an inflammation of the lungs. Um, but it, it's caused by this particular virus. And in some uh, the more severe cases, the inflammation of the lungs is so severe that people have severe breathing difficulties and require intensive care and, mm -hmm. you know, on some occasions will, will die. So we saw, we heard before on the channel that I talked about 80% of people will have maybe mild symptoms to maybe kind of flu-like symptoms. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the 20% of people that develop the complications, so mm -hmm. a pneumonia. What I wanted to just sort of go through a little bit is talk about different types of respiratory infections and the differences between them. This is not a cold, it's not like the common cold, so we, we, we divide sort of respiratory infections into three types. We've got upper respiratory infections, lower respiratory tract infections, and pneumonia. So upper respiratory tract infections like a cold, sore throat, sinusitis, anything in the this bit here. And usually that's a pretty mild illness. If you then go to this bit here, what we call a lower respiratory tract infection, that'd be affecting the airways. That might be the bronchial tubes, so a bit of bronchitis. Um, bronchiolitis in children. Whereas in pneumonia, the inflammation is in this bit here, it's in your lungs. And obviously that's more serious because it's interfering with your ability to take oxygen out of the air. Um, and the classical pneumonia that we're kind of mainly used to dealing with is a bacterial uh, infection, uh, what, used to, you know, what we call uh, pneumococcus. And that is often a, a quite easy illness to pick out in terms of how it affects people. The viral pneumonia that you get with things like um, uh, uh, coronavirus is closest to the severe pneumonia that you get with flu or influenza and so it will typically have a sort of a flu-like illness at the onset um, but with fever and cough developing into shortness of breath and I think the, the typical feature of it is that it affects typically both lungs whereas mm. a bacterial pneumonia will affect one lung usually quite densely in one part of one lung whereas this type of viral pneumonia will typically present in affect both lungs and that's why it has a you know, tendency to cause more severe effects. So normally in a bacterial pneumonia, we do a, you know, a wide range of bloods when someone comes. Mm -hmm. We cast a wide net to see mm -hmm. what's going on. And one of the things we'll see is a raised white cell count. Mm -hmm. But obviously we can see a raised white cell count in COVID-19, but not, not it, typically. Not so typically. It's, it's, it's sort of, in theory, it's a way to sort of pick out a viral as opposed to a bacterial infection. So typically with a bacterial infection, you get a higher total white blood cell count and you'll get uh, very high responses of inflammatory mediators like CRP, which will go sky high, indicative of effectively sepsis. Um, so in a viral pneumonia, from what we can see, the white cell count might remain relatively normal, uh, and the CRP, at least in the early stages, will also not go particularly high, may mm. even be normal, um, and you don't get the classical features of bacterial sepsis. Um, uh, because the damage to the lungs is mediated through a virus, through mm. a slightly different mechanism. We all got quite excited about the idea of using uh, a low lymphocyte count in the blood as a marker. I've been hurt. Uh, I'm hearing but, a lot yeah, about that. And, um, and certainly in the, in the studies, you know, many of the patients have a low lymphocyte count. The problem, of course, as you may have seen yourself, is that it's, it's, a, uh, it's a test that is low in lots of other conditions. You said about the CRP as well. So that's something we often see high in a bacterial infection, mm. but it will be raised. And I've seen, heard some things that it could almost be a kind of prognostic factor. I think that's right. So in the more severe patients, mm. um, it would appear that the CRP would start to rise towards the more severe stages of the illness. Fine. So when we, when we get um, an illness like COVID-19 in its extreme form, where we're not just fighting the virus, it's also our body's response to that, mm. that is creating lots of 
the symptoms, you know, lots of that fluid we're talking about that's mm, in the mm, lung mm. that we're seeing on the x-ray, lots of the changes in the blood tests. Mm, mm. So it's very much your own inflammatory response and, it, you know, it cuts the heart of what infections are, but actually, generally, it's not so much the germ that kills you, but the way your body responds to the germ. Mm. Um, and that's true actually for meningitis and lots of other types of infections. Um, the particular response in coronavirus is unusual and it seems to be uh, particularly severe, um, um, although it's, you know, uh, it, it can occur in other viral infections like flu, but perhaps less commonly. In terms of management then, obviously we don't get the diagnosis straight away in a lot of mm -hmm. places. Some people have on-site testing, but we have to send the swabs away. Um, so we'll treat as COVID-19. Well, what would be the initial treatment then for someone that comes in? Um, the problem we've got is that we don't have many effective treatments. So a lot of the treatment is supportive, so it's really about oxygen. Um, uh, we, as you know, often end up giving antibiotics because we can't be sure it's not a bacterial infection. You know, there may be situations where fluids would be useful, but, you know, most people don't require fluids. And so in terms of conventional treatments, that's about where it ends in the early period. Um, there are um, the other key parts of treatment are probably about basic care, so it's about regular observation of the patients, deciding where they should be managed, um, deciding uh, uh, the most important thing is whether the person is somebody that is strong enough to withstand um, intensive care treatment, whether they would be fit enough to go onto a ventilator, that is probably the key part of uh, the decision making at that point. There are people with this condition who will die, um, who need to be offered um, palliation and you know uh, um, tender loving care rather than aggressive medical treatment and identifying that early makes a lot of sense. There are obviously lots of speculation around a moment about possible other treatments for coronavirus. Um, we are a long way short of any validated treatments that have been shown to be effective. One thing I just want to say as well about how you um, look out for managing patients to think about the time course of the illness. So typically um, you will have been exposed to the infection for a period of days after which you will start to develop some symptoms. Typically that might be about three to five days. Um, and then you will have a perhaps a typical viral illness. You might have you know, fever, cough, um, muscle aches, that sort of thing. And for many people that's where it would end. Mm -hmm. um, for people with more severe um, manifestations of the disease, often those that will occur several days down the line. So for those people affected, there is that sort of uncomfortable period of sure. making sure that you reach out to the sort of five, six, seven, eight, ten days where, where um, uh, more severe effects can occur. Yeah. So it's when you're assessing somebody uh, in the acute situation, knowing how long their illness has taken place is really, really important. Dr Jenkins, thank you so much. Pleasure. Uh, I just want to say, uh, on a personal level, mm -hmm. This is a very strange time. You know, mm, Boris mm. Johnson described it as a kind of once in a generation public health crisis. Mm, mm. You, you know, very experienced clinician, what are your personal thoughts entering this time? Uh, nervous. Um, I would say that um, it's going to be a difficult time ahead. Um, the key thing is we don't know how long it will last or how severe it will be. However, I would say we'll get through it. So it's so good to chat to the consultants because they're so calm and professional and although they haven't necessarily seen something like this before, they've been through some crazy things within medicine. So they can, you know, pull on that experience to inspire some of us juniors. Oh. So, end of vlog. <laughs> end of vlog, end of vlog number three. So did we achieve our three things? So we talked a bit about how we approach a respiratory condition in the emergency department. We talked about how COVID-19 patients might present and some of the investigations as well. And the final thing, did I keep my hair in order? I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments. I'm gonna do one more vlog this week on Sunday just to kind of recap on the whole week and a bit more of a reflective thing on you know, how things are going, how I'm feeling, and um, the things I've learned through documenting this journey so far. Thank you so much for the support. I really appreciate it. If you're suffering from the coronavirus or friends or family are, we're thinking of you, particularly anyone that has lost loved ones at this, you know, really difficult time. We're all in this together. So follow the national advice you're getting and stay safe, everyone. And I'll see you soon.